1960s, at the height of the Cold War, one aircraft became a potent symbol of British air power. This hugely powerful machine had one purpose and one purpose alone, to intercept any aircraft that posed a threat to the United Kingdom's airspace. The aircraft was the English Electric Lightning. The prototype of the Lightning first flew in 1954, but even then, its future was uncertain because there was a school of thought that said you could defend the skies of the United Kingdom with surface-to-air missiles and not manned aircraft. Luckily, the aircraft supporters won the day and the Lightning entered service in 1960, where it remained as the RAF's frontline fighter for over 20 years. Despite the tireless work of Lightning enthusiasts, the UK aviation authorities do not currently allow lightnings to fly, believing their maintenance demands are too high for civilian operators. But there are no such problems in South Africa. So I've come to Cape Town to meet a man who's devoted a lot of time and money to keeping lightnings in the air, Mike Beachy Head. Mike, you're the founder and the chief executive of Thunder City here in South Africa. You've got an amazing collection of aircraft here. What's your interest in aviation? How did this all get started? The Palamount sent me a, a Sotheby's auction catalogue in which the MOD were laying off some old uh, hunters and various other things. And, you know, it's like you get a bit of a rush of blood to the head. And I thought, why not? I mean, you know, every self-respecting family should have a military jet. You'd be amazed. I mean, some people have lightnings in their front yards, yeah. you know, and... Uh, but they're not flying lightnings. No. That's the difference, isn't it? Oh, very much so. So if you're going to do this, do it properly, do it, you know, go big or go home. And, you know, we ended up acquiring quite an amazing collection of aeroplanes. All of them serviceable, all of them flyers. A lot of people don't realise it's not just acquiring an aeroplane. I mean, you actually get an aeroplane for next to nothing. But to integrate a system and skills and people and spares inventories and all that sort of thing behind it is the real challenge. I mean, a lot of people said this could never be done. But uh, I think we put one over on them. And looking at it, when you say this could never be done, looking at it, you've got an amazing selection of aircraft here. What's your personal favourite aircraft? The diplomatic answer would be the, these are all such different aircraft. And you find, you know, aeroplanes of this genre or, or time were purpose-built for specific tasks. Like Lightning is a supersonic high-level interceptor. Buccaneer is a low-level nuclear strike attack aeroplane. Hunter is a fighter. I mean, I particularly like the way that the lightning looks. I mean, you've done a beautiful job on getting it back into this sort of condition. Well, this is a, <coughs> a particularly special aeroplane because it was the first lightning that we actually rebuilt. It was actually a ground-up restoration. <coughs> and we'd started the restoration in England when the UK CAA poured a cold water on the, uh, our ability to fly it out of there. And um, a lot of great British engineers, South African engineers who worked on this thing, shipped it halfway around the world rebuilt, reassembled, and flew it. Hence, you'll see it's called BBD, Big Bad Dog is its nickname. What you see here at Thunder City is we've got the, the only three flying lightnings in the world, in fact. Sometimes heartache, but overall, man, it's been a good ride. In many ways, this is the iconic image of the lightning. Two Rolls-Royce Avon engines stacked one on top of the other. Together, they develop about 36,500 pounds of thrust when they're in full afterburner. Lightning pilots often talked about the sheer power of the machine. And looking at these two brutes, you can see exactly what they meant. The Lightning was a quantum leap in performance. The climb rate, the climb speed, the climb angle um, was stupendous. Almost as if somebody grabbed the world and pulled it away from you. And I well remember that my first ride in the Lightning, my pilot was a chap called Jim Jewell, who was still flying today. And as we climbed out this enormously powerful aeroplane going up at an angle which I couldn't believe, he looked at me and he said, uh, young man, you'll notice the only reason we have wings on the Lightning is to keep the nav lights apart. To protect NATO's airspace, the Lightnings were ready to get airborne 24 hours a day, 365 days a year at a moment's notice. It was called Quick Reaction Alert. And from my experience in the Falklands and in the UK sitting on QRA, most of the time it was just boring. But every now and then the siren would go and you didn't know, is this an exercise or is this the one for real? You simply got up, ran to the aircraft and got airborne. Call data, primary stud six, secondary nine, mission 
number 74. Scramble, 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 acknowledge. Cliff Spink found himself on battle alert in his lightning during the Turkish invasion of Cyprus in 1974. I was battle one, a primary battle aeroplane. Alert horn went. Um, I went and got into the aeroplane, and uh, much to my surprise, the controller said, alert one lightning, we have six tracks coming down from Adana. I was rather glad to look over my shoulder and see my flight commander, Henry Plojek, jumping into the other lightnings. And I thought, well, the odds are going to be slightly better. We launched off proceeded to intercept some RF-84s from the Turkish Air, Air Force, and they looked pretty nervous as well, I have to say, because I'm sure they didn't know what our reaction was going to be. In the end, there was a crisscrossing the skies of Cyprus where these quite small recce aeroplanes from Turkey with one of these latched onto it. Quick reaction scrambles in the UK led to some interesting encounters with Russian aircraft marauding into UK airspace, as Peter Collins remembers. If it was a QRA scramble, um, the intention would be to get yourself into a position where they knew you were there, so that uh, they were aware that they had been intercepted. Um, and they would know that this would happen. And there were quite often uh, relatively friendly uh, um, dialogues, if I can use that word, between the two crews. I mean, you'd get the uh, the tail gunner in a, in, a, in a bison holding up a copy of Playboy or something of that kind. Or he'd be having a cup of tea and he'd give you two fingers. <laughs> These guys clearly had the time of their lives flying the lightning in the RAF. Now, it was my turn for the full lightning experience. First, I met my pilot, Dave Stock. Just give that seat pan handle a tug for me, just so that you get a good idea. It's not often you get the chance to do this, but how far you have to pull it to leave the airport. I've done it, I know. I won't be needing to do that, don't worry. I won't be needing to do that. Not many people get a chance not only to fly a military aircraft, but to fly, fly something as unique as the Lightning. So uh, this is one I'm looking forward to. Okay, we got two engines. Let's go. Let's go. Oh, yeah. Full dry power. I'm just waiting for it to stabilize. I'm bringing in one afterburner. The afterburner's in air speed is alive there, you can see it. And you can feel that thrust. Okay, that's 100 knots. 120. Second afterburner's in. That's 150. Full afterburner. Gear cycle. That's South Africa in Cape Town. This is the English Electric Lightning. John, what I'm doing, turning out to sea, and I'm going to start accelerating through 37,000 feet. Okay, so we got 100% power. I'm bringing one afterburner in. Not much of a kick at this level. Okay, and then we have full afternoon. You can feel the vibration. Yeah, you can really feel it, can't you? Yep. 
and the other afternoon is in, and we're now supersonic. Well, just about. You wouldn't believe that. Well, that's us travelling along happily at Mach 1. Yeah. You, I think people would expect that you'd there'd be something more, I don't know, that you'd hear a sonic boom or something. Yeah, only on the ground. Yeah. 40,000 feet in a lightning and just through the sound barrier, just over Mach 1. An experience I'd never thought I'd have. Going supersonic in the lightning is really easy, but slowing to subsonic speed without stalling the engine can be slightly trickier. So it's important to, to actually get back subsonic. Yeah, I'm just I'm nursing the engines yeah. as well, yes. but yes. You can't you can't just pull the throttles back and oh no. It's yeah. not a it's not a modern airplane. Yes you can, 99% of the time. One time it'll bite you. Yeah. And what sort of uh, fuel burn would it have? Kind of max drive power? It's about a uh, hundred and twenty liters a minute. Right. And full dry. Uh, obviously that's at low level, or sort of below ten thousand feet. Yeah. The higher you go the better you burn. And this was just fantastic for you, isn't it? Being able to fly yeah. the lightning in your spare time. Oh yeah, it's great. The lightning is a wonderful piece of kit. And just starting to, to really, the alpha's coming on now. Yeah. You can see that the nose is way up there. And you haven't got an alpha uh, indicator in the cockpit, have you? No. So you're just kind of, kind of visualising. Yeah. You can feel it. Yeah. The one thing that the English electric light is really famous for is this awesome power. And you can really feel that kicking. Accelerating up through 300 knots. Burners coming in, really feel that pressing back now. 400 knots. 450, still being held in the back of the seat. 500 knots at about 100 feet. The other thing that the lightning is really famous for is its intensely fantastic rate of flame. Through 11,000 feet. This rate of climb outstrips many modern jets, like my old aircraft, the Tornado. It's hard to believe the Lightning is over 50 years old. No wonder it was the stuff of little boy's dreams when it first appeared in the skies. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to climb to 20,000 feet and then call ATC and ask them to take us home. Roger, Roger. Is it uh, a difficult airplane to land with its uh, swept back wings? Um. It's very much like the Mirage 3, although it lands about 20 knots slower, yeah. which makes it easier. Uh, the big trick with this airplane is the very thin tyres, yeah. which make it very difficult in the ground handling. You've got to be very, very careful. We've got air brakes on, we've got three wheels, we've got the flaps down. Everything looks about right, speed's good. Okay, speed's good for the shoot. There's the shoot. Well, what can you say about that? That's uh, marvellous, really, really fantastic. I thought it would be, um, I don't know, an older aircraft, noisier. Uh, the cockpit's a bit small, but uh, I think what stands out is the, uh, is the just the acceleration. This is, it's just a brute. It's a monster with two engines stuck on it, to be honest. Uh, awesome, can't say anything else. The Lightning is an important aircraft in the history of British aviation. It was conceived in 1947 as the country's first supersonic fighter, but just seven years earlier, the RAF had been fighting a war with Gladiator biplanes with a top speed of just 250 miles an hour. It was an amazing leap forward, and it was masterminded by Teddy Petter, English Electric's chief designer. With engines mounted above each other, Petter's design was radically different from other aircraft. It also included some innovative engineering. The whole idea in Teddy Petter designed this machine was to have a minimal frontal cross-section. And everyone thinks because it's got two engines stacked like that, they're actually not. They actually stack one behind the other. So if you like, you've got one and a half engines, and it's incredibly clever um, ducting. If you think this airplane can waz along at Mach 2 and still be feeding you know, slower air or subsonic air into the engines, they don't get a compressor stored, it's amazing. So flying an aircraft that's a, a 40 or a 50-year-old military fighter, it must be quite difficult to actually fly. 
No, well, you know, certainly I don't find the handling characteristics of the aeroplane at all. It's actually very docile. You know, there's a bit of myth about it being called the, the frightening. But you also understand that we operate these things in, in day visual conditions. Highly different story, some poor guy in the 60s in shockingly bad weather out of Binbrook with no fuel and no visibility and he's looking into a radar. As an operational thing, that becomes really, really difficult. It was an aeroplane that we could easily run away with you. Um, you had to be ahead of it. Uh, and you not only had to be ahead of it in performance terms, but it was a gas guzzler. Fuel management was absolutely critical. Um, you planned your sortie, you had to know where you were in relation to your, either your landing field or your diversion. Um, at all times, you had to have one, one eye on the fuel gauges. I thought it was a great builder of captaincy in young men. You had to manage that aeroplane from the time you started taxiing. So air-to-air -air refueling became the norm for young Lightning pilots. Air-to-air -air refueling was almost a, a daily occurrence for us. The probe was fixed, which did actually just slightly reduce the indicated airspeed limit by about 25 knots. But the aeroplane was so controllable that when you sat behind, you, you really felt that the aeroplane was part of you and it, it, you felt it. And even the smallest control movements the aeroplane would respond to. And in a tanking, which is essentially formation, um, it was great. Although you couldn't see the end of the probe, that was down to your left-hand side. And when you first started, you had to know that as you closed up, up to the wing, using the references on the wing and the pod, that that would actually go in. If you started to look, you were lost. It was a technique which Sometimes it was hard one, but once you got it, it was not a problem. Later versions of the Lightning had enlarged fuel tanks in an attempt to extend the aircraft's range. Mark VI with a much bigger ventral tank, and this is one which is all fuel tank. Um, in some, and certainly the ones we flew in Cyprus, we had two 30mm cannons in the front of this assembly. Uh, I remember speaking to an American once, and he said in a sort of a Texan drawl, he said, only a Brit would put guns in a fuel tank. Towards the end of its career, the Lightning fulfilled a different role, as it was adapted to a changing tactical threat. Peter Collins was the station commander of a Lightning squadron based close to the East German border. Our role became uh, much more low level. We knew very well that just over the border were many of these um, Soviet forces in Germany air bases which were capable of mounting a low-level, very fast attack against any targets within NATO. The Lightning wasn't only very fast, it was extremely maneuverable and a very good aircraft in air combat. And we reckoned that we could cope with any threat that we perceived uh, and we regularly practiced these tactics against NATO aircraft of, of, of threat performance. We knew very well that we could, uh, we could uh, wipe the arse off those. But when you were on a, on a battle flight scramble from Goodersloe, unlike the ones from QRA in, in the UK, you knew very well that you were being scanned by enemy ground radars only a matter of miles away. It kept the adrenaline level high. We did regard ourselves, to use the warm phrase, of, as Cold War warriors. It's great seeing these old aircraft again. When I first joined the Air Force, this was still flying. And when I left in 1996, 11 Squadron, which is this aircraft, was my, my last squadron. It's just great to see them. It's a shame that we haven't got any flying in the UK. My time in Cape Town was coming to an end, but there was just enough time for one last flight with Mike in the Lightning. about the aircraft. Just you know, raw sex appeal, raw power. See, he's such in touch, he's so in touch with the airplane, there's no fly by wire to isolate you. Yeah, there's you and this incredible machine. 
I presume Cape Town in particular must be an ideal place to operate the sort of flying operation that you do. Well, I mean, apart from the fact we've got a great bunch of guys in the tower normally, uh, look at the airspace around you here, pretty uncluttered, it's not a high density area, and you know, south of Cape Town, of course, next stop Antarctica, so we think it's pretty good. Yeah. Hear that lovely howl as the uh, intake air comes rushing through. Yeah, it's a very, very charismatic feature of the line. setting of a Cape Town. Absolutely fantastic experience to be up here at six and a half thousand feet, 400 knots in this wonderful old aircraft. The English Electric Lightning is an iconic part of British aviation heritage and it's absolutely fantastic to see flying examples preserved here in Cape Town South Africa so that future generations can enjoy its legendary speed and its power and its noise as I have here in the aptly named Thunder City.